Derivatives and bubbles, austerity and cutbacks, bailouts for Wall Street and bail-ins for Main Street. It's hard to find anyone outside of the rarefied world of television talking heads who doesn't understand that the international financial system is broken and spinning increasingly out of control. But the debate over what to do about it is rancorous, fractious, and rarely enlightening. Proposed solutions include government belt tightening, taxing the rich, increasing quantitative easing, or voting for the political candidate who seems to offer the best deal for a given tax bracket. But all of these solutions miss the point. Money. Money is the common denominator of our current financial system, the currency that facilitates all of our daily interactions. We take its existence for granted, and while the debate in recent years has grown to include whether or not the government should print more of it or print less of it, the lack of comprehension about how dollars, euros, yen, pesos, and other government-regulated national currencies are themselves the very root of the problem, conceived in iniquity and born as debt owed to the commercial banking system itself, has prevented the conversation from moving past this infantile debate. In recent years, mathematicians, cryptologists, computer programmers, and others have been working quietly on the problem of how to create a system of exchange that bypasses the central banks and allows for instantaneous, pseudonymous, free transactions between individuals anywhere on the globe. Their answer? Cryptocurrency, with its most well-known representative, Bitcoin. A currency as loved and hated as it is misunderstood by the public and misrepresented in the press, Bitcoin has created passionate advocates and powerful enemies as it continues to maintain a price that many believed impossible. To gain perspective on the Bitcoin phenomenon and what it really represents, last week I had the chance to talk to Roger Veer, an entrepreneur and Bitcoin early adopter who travels the world spreading the message about Bitcoin and freedom. This is our conversation. All right, so let's start with the, um, the usual kind of name, rank, serial number. Describe yourself in one sentence. Uh, in one sentence will be hard, but my name is Roger Veer. And uh, I guess I'm an early adopter of Bitcoin and a uh, Bitcoin proponent for over three years now. Three years. All right. So, um, so you've been in this uh, fairly early, yeah. not, not quite at the beginning. I, I jumped in pretty much full time in, I think, February of 2011, which is pretty early by Bitcoin standards. Okay. All right. Yeah, Bitcoins were less than a dollar when I went crazy for them. So. Well, then you must be a very rich man. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've lost a fair and given away a fair number of Bitcoins along the way as well. All right. Well, let, let's talk about how you got into Bitcoin. Yeah, um, there's a radio program that I like to listen to uh, while I go about my life here in Tokyo. It's called Free Talk Live with the website freetalklive.com, which is basically a bunch of uh, libertarians and voluntarists talking about things that are of interest to them. And uh, the host of the show had mentioned Bitcoin, and I kind of Googled it and looked into it a little bit more. And from there, I realized, wow, this is really going to change the way everybody on the entire planet does any sort of business. Uh, and knew I had to get involved full time. And you know, here I am th over three years later and it's been pretty much every waking moment has been devoted to Bitcoin ever since. Well, that's a pretty dramatic change and w one would think you'd have to have been prepared to understand the significance of something like that. I mean, most people might hear about it and think it's just some crazy idea. You, s you saw the significance of it right away. What, what do you think prepared you for that? Yeah, I, I think uh, what prepared me for that is I had the exact right background to really realize just how important it was gonna be. And that background includes reading a bunch of books on uh, economics and how money works, and particularly books by Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises, really, I think, gave me a firm understanding of what the proper aspects of money are. And I also had a background in computer science and have been around computers pretty much all my life growing up in Silicon Valley. My day job before I found Bitcoin was selling computer-related hardware. Um, and then when I found Bitcoin and realized the monetary pro uh, aspects that it had, and then the, the technological properties as well, that it can't be shut down, that it's distributed, that there's no central server, it can't be controlled. I realized that this is the ideal form of money. It's the best form of money the world has ever seen, and it can't be stopped or shut down or controlled in any way. And I realized this is going to change absolutely everything. And I, you know, here I am, more than three years later, every waking moment for three years and around three months now have been devoted to Bitcoin. So were you involved in mining at that early stage? And I did a little bit of mining back then on uh, GPUs, uh, and then now I, I, let, I leave the mining to the professionals. But uh, back then, I, it was possible to do a little bit of mining with uh, your home computer. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it's been said about Bitcoin that uh, the, 
the, the less people understand about it, the more stridently they're against it or something of that sort, which I think cuts two ways because of course it means that it's, it's perhaps more sophisticated and, and smart than people uh, initially believe, but it also means that there's a problem in communicating the idea of Bitcoin. There's still a lot of people who are very reticent of it, maybe because they don't understand it. How would you describe Bitcoin to someone who is completely a beginner at it? So there's two things required for people to be able to understand Bitcoin. They have to understand the basics of the computer side of it, and you have to understand what money is. And most people in the world don't understand either of those. And then people to understand both of those are an even smaller subset. But what people have to understand about Bitcoin is that it's a completely decentralized network. There's no central server, there's no controlling company, there's no office. It's just free software that anyone can download and start running on their computer anywhere in the world. And that the Bitcoins themselves can be transferred to or from anyone anywhere in the world. And it's impossible for any bank or government or entity to block you from sending or receiving those Bitcoins. There's a limited supply of those Bitcoins. There will never, ever, ever be more than 21 million Bitcoins. And so be because, like everything, the price is set based on supply and demand, because the supply of Bitcoins is limited and the demand is increasing as more and more people start to use them and more and more websites start to accept them, the price of Bitcoins in terms of dollars is going to have to increase even a lot more than the $500 uh, per Bitcoin that it is today. And uh, the thing that really made it click in my mind why people were want going to want to use it is that uh, in the United States where I'm originally from, uh, it's ostensibly a free country, but you're not allowed to gamble on the internet with your own money. And I realized that there were lots and lots of people that want to play poker or gamble on the internet with their own money, but with credit cards or PayPal or bank wires, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but with Bitcoin, it's impossible for anyone to stop you from doing that sort of thing. So it clicked in my mind that people are going to use Bitcoin to gamble on the internet. And sure enough, more and more gambling websites are coming online all the time that allow people to do whatever they want with their own money when it comes to gambling. And I think that's a great thing. Um, and Back then, there weren't any gambling sites using Bitcoin, but now, sure enough, there's more and more yeah. and more shopping websites and more and more things coming online every day. Well, that's, that's interesting because, of course, it comes from the philosophical aspect of this and why people want this type of medium of exchange. But it also raises the, the specter in the minds of a lot of people who are listening to that, thinking, well, that just feeds into everything we've heard about Bitcoin. It is for illegal things, things that would otherwise be illegal. And, of course, that brings up the connotations of the Silk Road and, and everything of that sort. Um, isn't this just a way of trying to, to get around government rules and, and laws? Um, some people can use it that way if they want to, other people won't. Um, lots of websites are just using it as another, another payment method uh, to save fees over credit cards or PayPal. So um, ultimately, Bitcoin can be used however the individual wants to use it. It's just a tool and people will decide for themselves which way they're going to use it. I've heard Bitcoin described as not necessarily, a, or not intrinsically, a money, but a technology. And the technology is the blockchain was kind of the innovation that created the possibility for, for Bitcoin and, of course, all of the, the altcoins that have um, derived from it. Um, tell us about that technology. What is the blockchain and why is it such a revolution? Right. The, the thing, you know, I've been going around for three years saying Bitcoin is the most important invention in the history of the world since the Internet. What I actually mean when I say this, I mean the Bitcoin blockchain. So for decades, mathematicians and computer scientists had been, they thought basically it was impossible to prevent what's called the double spin problem. If you have some sort of digital code, there's nothing to stop me from making a copy of that and sending it to a bunch of different people. And the same thing, the same problem applied to digital money. They figured if I have one digital token, why can't I copy it to a whole bunch of other people? And the only way that they thought that it was possible to prevent that would be by having some sort of central authority to keep track of who has what copies of, of what digital tokens. And what the Bitcoin blockchain did is it was the first time ever in which people realized that, or Satoshi Nakamoto realized that it was possible to prevent this double spending without having a centralized entity. So if you use PayPal or Visa or MasterCard or whoever, there's a centralized ledger that keeps track of every single person's account and how much money they have in their account. And that ledger is stored on Visa's centralized servers or PayPal servers or wherever. With Bitcoin, there's a ledger that keeps track of who has every single Bitcoin and every single Bitcoin transaction. But instead of that ledger being on one server or one computer or one office, it's spread out on everybody's computer all across the entire world. Uh, and that ledger gets updated in steps with each other. And each update to that ledger is called a block. And each of those blocks are connected together in what's called the blockchain. And that blockchain is just the entire transaction history that's 
ever taken place on the Bitcoin network. And that's such a revolutionary technology that's going to allow all sorts of things in addition to just money. So the revolutionary aspect of that is that there is no and doesn't need to be and can't be any central location where that data is stored. And because there's no central location that that's stored, there's no central authority, there's nobody that the governments or police or businesses can go to and say, change this or alter that or freeze this person's account or undo that. It's beyond the control of, uh, of any entity. It's, it's kind of taken on a life of its own at this point and it's really, really exciting because nothing like that's ever existed ever before in the history of the world. Right. Um, of course, that also brings up the, the other connotation that a lot of people have um, with digital money as kind of the, the worrying point is that the, with the blockchain, you have a record of every transaction that's ever taken place. So you can theoretically uh, trace a transaction and, and the way that it flows through the system from not from person to person, but from address to address at any rate. And once it is, once someone is capable of pairing an address to an identity, then um, not only is it not anonymous, it's actually documented uh, forever, and there's no way to get rid of that, the record of that transaction. Right, so that's one of the neat things about Bitcoin is that the amount of privacy in your Bitcoin transactions can be decided by the user. So there's lots of great websites that are releasing tools that allow you to choose just how private you want to be with your Bitcoin transactions. One of the ones that I'm spending most of my time with is a website called blockchain.info. And there's actually free tools right there in the wallet that they provide that can allow you to send and receive your Bitcoins anonymously. Um, and for free too, we don't even charge anything for that. So uh, you can be as public or as private as you want with your Bitcoin transaction. That's very different than uh, your credit cards or bank statements at which you know, the, the banks or the governments can look at any time to see exactly what you've been buying or what you've been doing. Right. Well, it's certainly a lot easier for them to go to that central authority to, to find that out. But, but what about the recent revelations about the NSA and the way that it's collecting internet data wholesale? Um, that must make it much more difficult to enact the type of cryptography that would make that anonymous, truly anonymous. Yeah, well, it, it's hard to know exactly what sort of technologies the NSA has. But one of the things that has me so excited about Bitcoin is that most governments around the world, and the U.S. government in particular, fund just about everything they do through inflation rather than direct taxation. So some things people are gonna be more than willing to pay for. Lots of people are gonna be willing to pay for, you know, roads and fire departments and police and that sort of thing. Not so many people are gonna be willing to pay with their own money for the NSA to spy on all of them or for the United States military to drop bombs all around the world. And if the world starts using some sort of math-based currency like Bitcoin, governments aren't going to be able to just print money to fund all these things. So uh, I'm really excited about Bitcoin because I see it as an opportunity to to non-violently defund the NSA. If the NSA people that are working there don't get paychecks at the end of each month, they're not gonna show up anymore. And all those really smart people that are working at the NSA can hopefully go and get hired to work for Bitcoin companies to, to work to make the world a better place rather than to spy on everybody for a big brother. And that's one of the things that has me so excited about Bitcoin is how it's gonna rein, rein in uh, the control that governments have over people. That is interesting. It provides its own solution to the problem that it it raises so yeah. that's and the more that it's adopted the more and privacy and freedom people there's lots and lots of bitcoin companies that are hiring right now so if mm -hmm. any of the people at the nsa want to get a jump uh leave the nsa today and come start working for uh, for, the, for the for the good side right <laughs> okay well i've heard it said by by yourself and others that uh, that basically there's there's nothing that can be done to to shut down bitcoin at this point barring i guess the complete eradication of the internet from the face of the planet which is a rather tall order, but there are always externalities and points of pressure by which, if not the block Bitcoin can be completely eradicated, at, at least it, there are pressure points that governments can use. There was the recent ruling by the IRS that uh, about capital gains tax with regards to, to Bitcoin usage. There's um, there's there's uh, recently um, uh, the Icelandic government attempted to implement something called Aurora Coin um, that ended up going pretty atrociously, and I believe it's, uh, it's pretty much been abandoned by this point because of technical and security issues. Um, there, uh, it seems to me there's always ways that governments can come and kind of do something to, to, to Bitcoin, if not to get rid of it, at least to ad manipulate, adjust, or, or change people's perceptions of it. Uh, what, what do you say to people who have those types of concerns? Certain governments may do certain things to try and inhibit the growth of Bitcoin. But it really, it only just takes one country anywhere in the world to be friendly to Bitcoin for Bitcoin to really be able to take off. Because at some point, 
Bitcoin will have a large enough market cap and a stable enough price where people won't feel compelled to instantly convert Bitcoins back into some sort of government issued currency. And when Bitcoin hits that point, it's just so incredibly easy for anybody to use as a payment method that if people want to use it, they will. Um, a good example, I guess, is in the United States. You know, most drugs are illegal, yet you can get them anywhere, including in actual prisons in the United States. Drugs are still available. So if people want to use Bitcoin, they're still going to have the ability to. And uh, Bitcoin, you know, it crosses borders just as easily as radio waves do. So uh, it's not really stoppable in that. It can be slowed down, but it can't be stopped. Mm. Well, what do you think about the altcoin phenomenon? Because there's nothing inherently about Bitcoin per se that's unique. It's the, the blockchain technology which could be used by anyone, of course, and is being used by more and more in different altcoins. Um, is there a difference between Bitcoin and the various altcoins? Uh, the big difference is the amount of processing power behind Bitcoin. Bitcoin is uh, by far and away the largest uh, network ever. It's a Bitcoin network is, I don't even know how many more times more powerful than the t world's top 500 supercomputers combined. So several years ago it was already more powerful, now it's probably hundreds if not thousands of times more powerful than the world's top 500 supercomputers combined. Whereas these other altcoin networks, the amount of processing power being used to secure them isn't anywhere near as big and makes them much more susceptible to various forms of attacks. And that's exactly what happened with Aurora coin that you mentioned earlier, as people attacked it and were able to successfully kill it. Attacking Bitcoin in the same way, I don't think is possible at, at this point um, and hasn't been possible for a couple of years now. Um, and that's what makes Bitcoin so much more secure. I personally don't own any of the altcoins, and the reason for that is that none of the altcoins currently are able to do anything that Bitcoin doesn't already do. And what makes the money useful is the number of people that are willing to interact and accept and exchange with that money. And Bitcoin, by far and away, has the largest network and largest number of people using it. So I don't really see any benefit in starting to adopt any of these other altcoins because you only have a limited number of hours in the day for these programmers that are coding the websites, they should focus on one particular coin, which I think is Bitcoin, rather than spreading their time a bunch, a whole bunch of uh, other coins to do the same thing that Bitcoin already does. I don't see the point there. In, in some ways, isn't this the test of the type of uh, voluntary free market um, ideas that, that Bitcoin springs from? If the market gravitates towards Bitcoin, then it, it will gravitate towards Bitcoin. If not, then perhaps altcoins will gain some traction. Yeah, every once in a while, you, I'll, I'll hear from people who really don't like Bitcoin, and I tell them, that's fine. Don't use it. <laughs> Nobody's forcing you to. And it's the same thing with, with Bitcoin and all the altcoins. If you want to use an altcoin, feel free. I'm not going to stop you. No, I hope nobody is else is going to stop you either. Um, but if, if, if you want to, go for it. If not, don't worry about it. All right, you're Bitcoin Jesus, which is a, uh, a silly and uh, I suppose blasphemous name, depending if <laughs> your religious beliefs. Um, but if you are a Bitcoin Jesus, what does Bitcoin heaven look like? What does Bitcoin heaven look like? Um, I think Bitcoin heaven looks like an entire planet of people using a money that they've chosen to use voluntarily and that arbitrary groups of people can't just create more of out of thin air. Um, so I suppose we're, we've up till now we've been living in Bitcoin hell, um, but we're on the road to Bitcoin heaven and we can see that every day by all these new businesses starting to adopt Bitcoin and new users starting to use Bitcoin and uh, I think we're definitely headed in the right direction. So, so walk us through a day in Bitcoin heaven where Bitcoin is fully implemented and everyone's using Bitcoins for their transactions. What does that look like from a day-to-day -day perspective? Um, I don't think there's any one person that can answer that because there's you know, billions of people on this planet with billions of individual wants and needs and desires. And Bitcoin is just a protocol that anyone can choose how they want to use that protocol in their day-to-day -day life. So uh, I think a lot of the ways in which people are going to use Bitcoin haven't even been uh, thought of yet. So uh, that's not a question that I can really predict other than uh, in my version of Bitcoin heaven all human interaction will be on a voluntary basis and no groups of people will be forcing their 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 view on, on others. Are there any drawbacks at all to the idea of using a cryptocurrency? Uh, if you're part of the, the current power elite that can just print money at will to spend on whatever you feel like then yeah uh, the world switching over to Bitcoin is probably not going to benefit you, but if you're one of the normal people that uh, aren't working for you know, the Federal Reserve or any central bank that's printing money to, to pay to your friends and that sort of thing, then uh, a Bitcoin world is a wonderful thing for you. We are on a, a kind of adoption curve for Bitcoin right now, and I'm not asking you to prognosticate, but 
given your kind of experience with Bitcoin and, and you've watched it develop for the last few years, where do you think it's going to be a year from now, five years from now? I mean, what, what type of curve are we looking at and how long will it take for, for the kind of implementation that you're looking for? The, the adoption rate up until now has been pretty darn amazingly fast um, from just a, f you know, a few hundred users at the beginning and to you know, millions today. And I think it won't be very much longer before we hit tens of millions and then hundreds of millions. And I think, if anything, the rate of increase is going to, to speed up rather than, than slow down. Um, the amount of venture capital money that's just being absolutely poured into Bitcoin startups is just uh, incredible. Um, all over the world, not, not just in Japan or the U.S. or Europe, just absolutely everywhere. Uh, it's just incredible. And I'm, I'm headed later this week over to Moscow. There's a Bitcoin conference in Moscow, and the Russians are excited. The Chinese are excited, of course. The Americans are excited. Just every country you turn to in the world, people who understand Bitcoin are excited about it. So I think the rate of, uh, of adoption is going to increase. Uh, what about the, uh, the, the problem? I, I forgot to look up the percentage, but there is a, uh, a, a, a rather large percentage of the Bitcoin that exists currently are held by relatively few addresses, people. Um, and I, I, I'm afraid I don't have those, those statistics off the top of my head. But, but it was, it was a, a, a number that one would not expect in a, a currency that would be implemented. I mean, if 50% of, of uh, the US dollars were held by Actually, there is a <laughs> kind of income inequality, but anyway, um, it, it's, it poses a potential problem in that uh, it, there are many people who are concerned that there are people who are holding on to Bitcoin for that moment in which they decide to cash in, and that will be the end of Bitcoin. Um, what do you say to that? Uh, it certainly won't be the end of Bitcoin. For people that are actually worried about that, then don't use Bitcoin if you don't want to. Um, but I don't really see how it can be any worse than the system that we have today because right now the wealth is certainly concentrated in the hands of a, a relatively few number of people and the big problem with the system right now is that they can print more money at any time for, for any reason they feel like and with Bitcoin that can't happen so I see Bitcoin as a huge, huge, huge step forward from what we have today. Mm -hmm. Well, we are sitting here in Tokyo in April of 2014 so I think we have to talk about Mt. Gox and what happened there. Um, First of all, any thoughts on, on what happened with Mt. Gox and why it um, took place in the way that it did without, an, well, without people blowing the whistle in a way that actually prevented it from happening? Yeah, um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I suppose, you know, I've, I've met the guys at Mt. Gox more than most people in the world have. I've actually met them in person, but in hindsight, I have no idea what the heck happened over there. Uh, and it's just shocking, the whole, the whole thing is shocking. And the part that really disturbs me the most is that they were claiming they only had 2,000 Bitcoins, and then people on the internet monitoring the blockchain said, no, 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 we have really, really, really strong evidence that you have an additional 200,000 Bitcoins. And then suddenly Mt. Cox said, oh yeah, you're right, we do have an additional 200,000 Bitcoins. To me, that really, really, really seems suspicious. Um, but as to what actually happened and went on over there, I, I don't know. Um, they asked me to make that video for them about a year ago now. And uh, at the time I made the video, and even going back and watching that video, I regret that having made that video because it caused more people to trust Mt. Gox, but every single thing I said in the video at that time, even in hindsight today, everything was true in the video. Uh, it was just unfortunate that I made the video because it caused more people to trust Mt. Gox than, than would have otherwise. Um, but they had a huge amount of U.S. dollars sitting in the bank. They had around close to 100 million U.S. dollars in the bank. I saw the letters from the banks and from the lawyers with my own eyes, with the bank saying, we're not going to let you send more than 10 international wire transfers a day, which obviously isn't enough for them to run the business. So at that time, even looking back on everything, it's pretty darn clear that the fiat withdrawal delays were being caused by problems dealing with the banks, not because they didn't have everybody's money at that point. They, they may not have had everybody's money at that point. I don't know. It, even today, I don't know. But uh, the, the fiat withdrawal delays weren't being caused by an actual lack of liquidity, which is what I said in the video. And I wish I hadn't made the video at all at this point. So what does the Mt. Gox situation say about the ability for people to be scammed in the Bitcoin community? People get scammed with dollars all the time too. Um, I think it just shows that people need to hold their Bitcoins in their own Bitcoin wallet. And if you're going to use an exchange for exchanging, Send the Bitcoins in, get the dollars out, and be done. Or the other way around, don't store your dollars or your Bitcoins on an exchange ever, other than the actual time in which you're actually trading. And the rest of the time, 
hold your Bitcoins in a wallet in which you control the private keys. That means hold them in a blockchain wallet, hold them in an Electrum wallet, hold them in an Armory wallet, hold them in the Satoshi QT client wallet. Don't hold them in Mt. Gox, don't hold them in Bitstamp, don't hold them in Kraken, don't hold them in Coinbase, don't hold them in any sort of wallet in which somebody else is holding the keys for you. That's what I hope will be the, the lesson that everybody learns from, from Mt. Gox. Are there any kind of positive aspects to this story? I mean, you say, for example, there were people doing the forensic investigation who kind of pieced together the fact that, that Mt. Gox was lying and was able to call them out on it. I mean, that shows at the very least there is the possibility for communities to hold people accountable and for the scams not to be able to be perpetrated in perpetuity. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm most familiar with the U.S. regulatory system and how the U.S. stuff works. and. You know, we had this uh, problem with a, a man named Bernie Madoff, and people lost a huge, huge amount of money, and a lot of people don't realize, and the media didn't play up, that Bernie Madoff was the head of the regulatory body that was supposed to be regula regulating all that sort of thing. So if, if that can happen with all the regulations we have right now, um, it looks to me like most of these government regulations are just an absolute waste of time and money and, and effort, and it keeps out the new players in the market that might be able to do something better or faster or cheaper or more efficiently than the current people in the market. And uh, you know, a real good example of that is in, in the US, there's no Bitcoin exchange in the US serving US customers at this point. Um, and that's because of all these stupid regula regulations that are there blocking that and preventing new people from, from coming on board. And it's really sad that that's the case. But uh, Someday, you know, in Bitcoin heaven, the whole world will just be using Bitcoin and everybody can do whatever they want with their own Bitcoins and they won't have to ask uh, people that they've never met ever before for permission to start a business using Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. if, a, if a 60 year old came to you today with their $100,000 nest egg and was saying, well, I, I'm trying to think of what to do with this investment, I'm, you know, I'm planning for a long, happy retirement, how much of it should I put in Bitcoin? What would you say to that 60 year old? Yeah, uh, it depends on what their entire net worth is. If they're wor only worth $100,000, probably don't put much of any of it in, in Bitcoin. Um, it also depends on what your time horizon is as well. If you're a young person with a higher risk tolerance, sure, put some more of that into Bitcoin. But uh, if, if you're getting up close to the age of ready to re ready, being ready to retire, um, don't put too much of your, your net worth in, in, in Bitcoin. But if you're a young person, with a higher risk tolerance, sure, go for it. So That was going to be the other part of the question. So if you're 25 and you're just starting out and you want to save every month, what percentage do you yeah, think people um, should be putting into Bitcoin? It, it kind of depends on your, your financial circumstances. Um, but uh, you know, if, if you have a lot of assets already, put a good chunk in, into Bitcoin. Uh, if you're worried about where your next month's mortgage payment is going to come from or, or rent payment, don't put too much in, into Bitcoin. Don't put more than you could afford to lose is probably good advice for anything. Never ever keep all your eggs in one basket, either. Very true. Speaking of which, well, I am a Bitcoin virgin, not in the sense that I don't have any, but I've never bought a Bitcoin. So, can I buy a Bitcoin? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not one Bitcoin. How about 0 0.1 Bitcoin? Whatever you would like. What is the exchange rate today? There's an app for that. <laughs> we are in the land of the Japanese yen, so I will demonstrate that I do have the useless paper fiat currency to back up this transaction. So it looks like one Japanese yen, I'm sorry, one Bitcoin is around 52,000 Japanese yen. So we'll go with 5,200? So, so point 0.1, yeah, is 50, we can call it 5,000 yen. Wow. It's fine, special, special <laughs> discounts. So, um, right. Do you have a Bitcoin address? I do. You? No, I don't know the best way to do this. You're gonna, that's my, uh, Okay, so I will scan that, and I will send you 0.1 bitcoins, which is around 5,000 yen, a little bit more. Wow. And while we're finishing up, that can process. How long does it take a, a transaction like that to process? Uh, if you check your phone right now, you should have it. That cannot possibly be. depending on the, uh, the speed of my connection. <laughs> <laughs> we can give you the Wi-Fi password if you'd like as no, well. No, no. <laughs> Do you see it? I have to sign in again. <laughs> and actually, uh, I heard that the app is still available in the Korean app store. I didn't have a chance to check that myself, but we can test that after we're done with the interview if you'd like.
and mm. maybe you can actually have the actual app on your phone. That would be helpful. Which would be handy. Yeah. Because, yeah, I don't have a jailbroken phone. Although our HTML5 app is going to launch any day now, maybe, maybe this week. Really? Yeah. Excellent. Now that's going to be handy. Yeah. Um, another reason not to go with Apple. Yeah. Well, I, I, suddenly I've been logged out and can't log back in. Oh. So uh, we'll confirm that after. <laughs> there will be no dramatic on-screen resolution to this. Um, all right. So any final thoughts that you have for anyone who is perhaps thinking about getting into Bitcoin, where would you suggest they go first off as the resource? So it, it depends on what country you're in. Um, if you're in the US, the easiest way by far to buy Bitcoins is Coinbase.com. But don't store your Bitcoins in Coinbase.com because they're holding them for you. So as soon as you buy them, transfer them out to a Bitcoin wallet in which you control the private keys. I personally recommend blockchain.info. But password security is very, very important as well. So I really recommend you use a password management software tool for that as well. Um, Electrum.org is also a very convenient one, or Armory, uh, Bitcoin Armory is an, another good one. Excellent. All right, any other final thoughts that you'd like to leave people with regarding Bitcoin and the future of money? Sure. Bitcoin isn't going away. It's not just a fad. It's not just a, a flash in the pan. Uh, it's going to change the way everybody in the entire planet interacts with everybody else, just in the same way the internet has changed how everybody on the planet communicates with everybody else. So spend some time right now today, educate yourself on Bitcoin. Go out and buy a little bit of Bitcoin so you can see how it works. And you can read about it all day long. Actually using it is by far the best way to understand how it works. So go out there and you know don't spend more money than you can afford to lose, but buy a little bit and send it around. Go and gamble on a gambling site a little bit or buy something from an electronic site or somewhere else. Test it out. And what, once you've bought something online with Bitcoin and you see just how much easier it is to buy something with Bitcoin than with a credit card, you realize, wow. This is a big step. And then when you realize that there's no chargebacks, there's no fees involved with it, like it's just so much better than 